morning, guys. Morning. morning. What a beautiful day. Windy. windy. It is. It's been windy, man. We need to uh, pray for rain. Uh, boy, we sure need it with all these fires and stuff. But um, I'm going to preach a message this morning. And I, I was asking the Lord on, on, on roll back the stone week two because we have Easter next week. Uh, Lord, what do, what do you want me to do this morning? And he said, just take on the pattern. You preach the pure gospel this morning. And so I'm just going to preach the pure gospel this morning. I just want the word. I want you to soak it in in your life. And I want you, just like we sang that song, to understand when I preach this, it is our living hope. Christ is our living hope this morning. And so as we go into this week of... Um, a beautiful week. It's it's it's. Uh, Miss Debbie said it's just one of my favorite weeks too, and so today's Palm Sunday, and um, we just want to prepare our hearts this week. We want to pray on Good Friday, not because it's Good Friday. We just want to, honestly. I just wanted to set that prayer time before on Sunday before Easter because I'm asking the Lord for a harvest of souls to come in. Easter is a big time, so y'all pray with me this week and believe that people come find Jesus next Sunday. That's what I'm hoping for. And so let's let's pray before I begin. Um, everybody bow your heads for a second. Lord, we thank you for everything you've done for us, Jesus. And as we did communion this morning, Father, in remembrance of you, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for us. We thank you, Lord, for taking our sins and our shame and our past, Father. And I thank you, Lord, with the power of your resurrection that that now we have the means, Father, to live this life as a believer, and we have our hopes set on eternity with you. And I thank you, Lord, that you put a coal upon my lips this morning. Thank you for uh, saving my life, and I love you. And I ask you, Lord, it's not by power nor by bite this morning, but by your spirit, says the Lord. And thank you, Lord. Uh, roll back that stone, week two. So I have an Easter message planned. It's going to be awesome next week. But this is a very important one. And I want you to sit back. This message is the pure gospel. And so as I preach this message, if you've never <coughs> truly seen the facts of the Bible about what happened when Jesus was uh, when Jesus went to the cross for us, when he went into the uh, went into the vision that the Lord, the Father's will, because he was all about his Father's business. He said, "It's not my will be done, but yours, Lord." And he was talking to the Father, and he said, "I I have something that I have to do, and whether it's scary or not, I've got to go into this, and I've got to fulfill what the Father told me to fulfill." And you know what that was? That was you and me. And so take this message personally this morning. And so I want to get into it. I'm going to be running, I'm going to be running fast like a fat kid running into a donut shop this morning. And so y'all just stick with me. I'm going to be running through the Word. But just stick with me and, and sit down and open your heart and relax this morning. And listen to this pure gospel message. And so we will begin on a day unlike any other. In a far off place named Calvary. Or another name was Golgotha which is called the place of skulls. This place of death was just outside the walls of Jerusalem. And on the side of this hill, one could interpret the large face of a skull, and it hewed in the rock formations. It's still there to this day. Old bones scattered on the ground. Get this picture in your mind. The stench was horrific, and the vultures were plentiful. And so you have a place called the place of skulls. It was outside the walls of Jerusalem, and it was a horrific place. It was a place of death. It was a place of filth. It was a place of shame. It was a place where dead bodies decomposed. And on the side of this hill, understand that there was a skull that was in to the side of the rock. To mark this moment, moment uh, this, this area where this epic incident happened. And a bloody, bruised, exhausted body of a man, listen, that bore deep wounds from the deep cutting stripes upon his back and on his sides. A crown of thorns that they hammered upon his head. Are you seeing this picture? A beaten face that was hardly recognizable. A horribly bruised body from the beatings that he took. And that body carried that cross to this horrible place that I'm talking about this morning. He went through all that. 
He should have, his body should have been in shock, the condition it was in. But he picked up that cross and he took that cross to that place, to that nasty place. He carried it to that place for you. Amen. He was then nailed upon the cross next to criminals and the crowds were laughing at him. You know, the same ones that laid the palm leaves out uh, a week prior. And so when he came into the city, they, lead, they laid the palm leaves out like right here. They laid it out in front and they Hosanna and they were cheering for him and everything. But the same people who did that were laughing and mocking and watching this man take on the suffering. And little did they know that he was doing it for them. Just like you're sitting in that seat this morning, he did it for you. The Roman soldiers were gambling for his garments. He was shamed, embarrassed, and mocked. And while suffering at all costs, he said, I must fulfill the will of the Father for each of you. Are you seeing this picture? And after he suffered by pushing himself up as long as he could with every last strain, because the nails were in his hand and in his feet, and he's finally, he could not take it anymore. And what happens when you're on the cross? You finally have to let go and you're sucking for every breath. And your lungs cannot take any more air. It's like drowning. And he's sitting there doing it for you. And as he took his last breath, he said, it is finished. And then he was dead. Matthew 27, 50 through 52. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks split. Also, the tombs were opened and the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. I, I, I want you to see this picture. The veil was torn in the temple. And he said, There's, and when that happened, it, 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 that made the mark. That said the law, is, that led, the law is fulfilled. And Jesus said, I just made a way to the Father for you. And all of a sudden an earthquake hit. And all of a sudden the rock started to split on that nasty hill called the Place of Skulls. And then it went dark. And zombie-like people were rising up out of the grave. Are you seeing this picture? The moment he died, the earthquake hit and the rocks split upon the countryside. For three hours, an eerie darkness was upon the sky, a darkening eclipse. The sun went dark for three hours. It said from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. And that was unlike any other day that these people had seen. Can you see this picture? Only a few people were left as the crowds had dwindled down and they went back to town. The bloody body hung upon the wooden cross was surely dead, and to all the followers and his observers that day, hope was gone. Roman soldiers were trained killers. Listen, if they had failed in their duty to execute someone, they would be held liable. If they did not do what they were told to do, they would be killed for not executing somebody because that's what the order was given. They gave the, this gave them the incentive, sorry, the incentive to complete every execution with precise precision. And on this day, that happened. The Gospels tell us that two rich religious men, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they were two secret disciples who had nothing to gain and everything to lose, stepped forward and arranged the burial for this body. Jesus' burial was done quickly. Everything had to be finished in a period remaining before sundown. I want you to see this picture. The bloody body. These two rich men that Jesus uh, was able to reach. And all of a sudden they said, well, we'll handle the body. And so they went and asked for permission. And they grabbed this bloody body off of this cross. When they slung him off the cross. And they did it in shame because to them, that was just some other person, another criminal they were fixing to throw into a pit. And they said, well... We have to give him a proper burial. It must be performed. And they were carefully observant of the Sabbath. The Sabbath, it had to be taken care of then. And take note of this. The body was placed in a new tomb carved in the rock. 
a brand new tomb. This tells us that no other bodies were in it. None. The body lay within the dark grave of the rock. I want you to keep this picture in your mind if I'm preaching this morning. Point number one, the earth was shaken. Luke 23, 53, then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. So it's a done deal. This body is put in the tomb. They got it accomplished before the Sabbath and now they are preparing. The witnesses had seen the body in the tomb. Sorrow was on their hearts and sadness loomed as they walked home in grief. You see, hope was diminished. But see, I've been there in life one time when I had no hope. I was addicted. I had, was, I, I had given up all complete hope. There had, I, that's all I knew. That's all I thought I knew. And the Lord said, guess what? There is still hope. So when they laid that body, all the people, they were walking away at home and they were grieving and they were sad. But the father said, yep, I still have hope because I still have the living hope. Even though the body lay in the tomb, Jesus Christ is always the living hope in your life. And as they rolled the huge stone in place and sealed the tomb, pure darkness fell upon this body. Sadness lay heavy upon their hearts. And they were sitting there and they went home and said, what kind of day was this? That the earthquake hit. That the temple was all tore up. That, that, the, that the rocks started splitting on the countryside. And they said, oh my gosh, there was dead people walking around Jerusalem. They came up out of the cemetery. Can you imagine a day like that in Blanco? That would freak me out. It would freak anybody out. An earthquake, an eerie darkness. Quite the unnormal day, wouldn't you suppose? And actually the people were saying, then, after all that, they finally said, this really could be the Son of God. Actually a Roman soldier, he goes, you know what? This man could be innocent. You think? Do you think? I'm sure they saw all that and went, yep, we might have messed up. Oh, you messed up, all right. And the Roman authorities verified this controversial man called Jesus was truly dead. As they sealed the tomb, a guard of Roman soldiers stood watch over the large stone that blocked the entrance. But I love how God works. <coughs> I love how God works. You see, like I said a while ago, when the world and all others seem to give up hope at times, when it looked like there is no way out, when it looked like the enemy's going to win, God said, hold up, wait a minute, let me put some power in it. Woo. There are moments I preach about that God is the God of the turnaround. God is the God of the turnaround in your life. And I want you to see this this morning. The, the thing, you, you sit there and you worry about, I can't change. I can't do this in my life. I have a nasty past. The Lord said, I'm the God of the turnaround and I'm the miracle worker. And so you believe that as I preach the gospel this morning. That's what the gospel is meant to be preached about. And God loves to be put in a position to work a miracle. He likes to have that position. He says when you put the faith toward a miracle, I'd like to be in that position to give you a miracle, son and daughter. A mighty paradox occurred. For the death which they thought to inflict on him and the dishonor and disgrace has become the power to death's defeat and all that it entitles. And then, guess what? The earth shook again. The earth shook again. When the stone was rolled back, when that power hit that dark tomb, life powerly exploded into that body and the grave linens fell off of that body. That body went like this. It raised up as the, the God Spirit quickened that mortal body that was laying down and he rose up because the power hit that area. And Jesus got up, and you know what he did? He simply wiped death off of him like he did the dust of that tomb. He got up out of that grave, and he went like this. Get off me, dust. But what he was really doing is saying, get off me, death, because I died, and I told you I'd be risen back on the third day. And Jesus got up, and they recalled his words then. In Matthew 19, 26, Jesus looked at them and said, 
With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And I'm here to tell you this morning, don't you ever forget that God is the God of the turnaround. He's always flipping the script. You see, this is the, one of the most powerful statements I'm going to preach this morning. You see, miracles are the reversal of the impossible. Let me say that again. Miracles are the reversal of the impossible. So if something is impossible and it looks like you have no hope in your life, understand that God said, I can flip the script because I have the power. And it's the same resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead. Point number two, their hearts were shaken. The witnesses looked in and saw Jesus was gone. And their hearts knew those prophetic truths He told them became pure reality. Check it out. Maybe from moments like this in Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders. And this is what he said. And the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, he would be raised. Matthew 28, 8. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy and ran to tell his disciples. They ran, half scared and half filled up with joy and told the others. Remember, we covered that last week because there was a little bit of hope dwelling up in their heart because they remember Jesus said, oh, they're going to kill me, but I'm going to be risen up on the third day. They didn't think he was for real. Luke 24, 11, but they did not believe the women. So the women went and told the disciples and because their words seemed to be like nonsense. That's what the Bible says. Women, get out of here. You crazy. You cray cray. Jesus didn't wake up and get up out of that tomb. Oh, yes, he did because there's no body in there. So why don't you go down and take a look for yourself? And the Roman soldiers, they were down there and they didn't do nothing about it. So I don't know what's going on. And in verse 12, Peter got up and ran to the tomb, bending over. He bent over. That Bible says he saw the strips of linen. So Peter got an up close deal and said, Oh my goodness. Where is the body? All I have is some little linen strips. And so Peter's thinking, Man, maybe he was preaching for real. And then when he said bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away wondering to himself, What happened? And then this. Hope is defined. Hope is birth. They feel and then they truly see hope. Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death for all time. And the Lord God will wipe tears away from all the faces. And he will remove the approach of his people from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. They ran into the one. They ran into the one. They ran into the one that was dead in that tomb who ate up death for all time. And at that moment when they ran into him, he was breathing new life. Can you say thank you, Jesus? Verse 9, suddenly Jesus met him. And Jesus was on the call. He said, greetings. <laughs> that man, body was quickened by the Holy Spirit. The power of heaven came down and raised that man up from the dead. And he walks up and he's like, Greetings. What's up? What's up, my peeps? He's like, man, I got the dust off of me. I just wiped that death off of me. I feel good this morning. It's easy like Sunday morning. Jesus was just chilling. He just said, I, I told you. Think about this. He rolls up on him. He puts his hand up to say hello. And, and this is not scriptural. But when he put up to his hand to say hello, maybe uh, a ray of sunshine was shining through them nail-pierced hands. Are you seeing this picture? He said, greetings. Wouldn't that be cool if the sun went boom, boom? He said, what's up? This one word, greetings, had changed the lives of humanity forevermore. And because of this, Jesus was truly alive. And I'm telling you this morning, to be a born-again Christian... And you don't have an option to believe this message that I'm preaching this morning. It is a must. You have to believe in your heart that he rose up from that grave and through the power of his resurrection, just like the word of God says. Verse 10, then Jesus said to them, hey, don't be afraid. Go and tell my bros to go to Galilee and they will see me up in there. I'll be up there. I'll meet you up there. But, and at that moment, they, they're sitting there shocked 
And he goes, hey, go tell my bros I'll be in Galilee in a bit. I got some things to handle, you know. I just went from the underlands of hell and stuff and went up and went back to heaven. Now I came and got resurrected. And so, you know, that ain't nothing because uh, all I got to do is travel to Galilee so I done handle a bunch of stuff in three days. Just tell them I'll meet them up there. That's how cool Jesus was. Death defeated. Sin was overtaken. Listen, the devil was trembling in his shoes. The demons were screaming. The whole earth was shaking and anticipating yet another earthquake because earthquakes were becoming quite the thing that uh, past couple days. And, and heaven is cheering. There's angels all around. Dead people are coming out of the grave still walking around Jerusalem. So when that resurrection power hit Jerusalem the second time, dead people were still walking around coming out of the graves because that power was so powerful. Isn't that crazy? That's how powerful of a power hit that region. And then it hit the whole world. Acts 2.24 But God raised him up again putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for uh, him to be held in its power. Death had no power. This power super exceeded death's grip. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus can secure that for you in your own life today. If you are not born again, if you are sitting here thinking, man, this story is crazy. Yes, you have to believe it by faith. But when you do, you can have eternity. And you can have the same power when you are, after this old life is gone, that within just seconds, you can sit there and you will know that you will be there in heaven in paradise with the risen one. Thank you, Lord. Roll back that stone. The moment that the Bible was written upon. The moment that all questions were answered. The moment, check this out, that I have given and, and gambled my entire life on. You see, I'm an old gambler. And so when I'm preaching you this pure gospel message, you better understand I done gambled my life and went all in for this message. It's called faith. Get faith. Rise faith in your heart. Let, let faith rise up in your heart this morning. That's the hope you have this morning. And when you have that hope, when you have an inkling of faith, it just takes a touch of faith. It just takes a little faith. You can have a brand new changed life in Christ. Point number three. Everybody was shaken. The hearts were shaken. Now everybody was shaken forevermore. Jesus' resurrection was witnessed by a lot of people over a 40-day period. Even historian non-Christian writers at the time verified these events. Can you believe that? And so, all I'm telling you is this is a real thing that happened. And people said, well, I just can't believe that. He just rose spiritually. No, He did not rise spiritually. He, The Holy Ghost quickened His mortal body and He rose up and He had the holes in His hands and feet. And he had the wounds on him. He rose to life. His own disciples had to be convinced. But the Apostle Paul, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers, is what Apostle Paul said, at the same time, most of whom are still living. That's in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. So for a 40-day period, he, he appeared to all these people. And the Apostle Paul wrote, a 500 people saw him. Can you believe that? He made known that he, when he was risen, that he was alive. Yet his own disciples had to be convinced again, like I just said. And eventually they truly were. They touched the wounds left upon his body. They ate with him. And their lives were then truly transformed. And I want you to listen to this. I want this to hit your heart. Defying every obstacle their loss of home, persecution, even death itself, they lived their lives by the evidence and the surety in their ministry that the power of the resurrection of Christ truly happened. They gambled their lives on it. They gambled literally their life on it. Their whole ministry, their whole purpose in life was based on the fact that Jesus rose up from the grave. And it changed the world forevermore after that, too. His disciples could have lied about it. It was only their lives at stake, you know. They could have lied. It, they, they could have lied about it. It was only their lives at stake. Why would you tell the truth if you knew you didn't have to to save your life? You get my point? 
Because their hearts had to speak the truth. They knew that too. But they wrote different accounts that they were called in the Gospels. And in my opinion, it would have been easy. It would it wouldn't have been, I'm sorry, it wouldn't have been easy to believe the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John if they had wrote the exact story. It, it, it just wouldn't have been easy. If if you were to read through the Gospels and the and the story was exactly detail for detail the same, that just wouldn't have come off good. Because guess what? When cops have a crime and they have multiple witnesses, what do they do? They come and interview the witnesses, right? Because guess what? Each witness presents different facts. Because some part, somebody might have seen something different than this person. And so the Gospels are true. Because if it would have been any other way, it wouldn't be believable. Think about that for a second. Every eyewitness has different details to a story. And now this is my entire point this morning. Y'all get with me right here. In many respects, check this out. An unresurrected Jesus is really easier to accept. Do you know that? An unresurrected Jesus to this world is really easier to accept. Can you get that? That it takes faith to understand that this man rose up out of the grave. But guess what? Easter makes him dangerous though. I'm going to say that again because I just, that's just, I just love preaching that. Easter makes him dangerous though. Because of Easter, guess what? People have to listen to his extravagant claims and they can no longer pick and choose from his sayings. You can't just go in and pick and choose. You either have to believe that he was risen or not. And if you believe that he wasn't risen, then how can you believe the word that he's quoted in the word of God? You get my point? Either you have to believe it or not. It's called faith. Easter means also that he's on the loose. My Redeemer lives this morning. I'm so excited about this week. I've been praying and I said, Lord, I know that you're alive. I know that Jesus, the Word of God says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So nothing changed. Nothing changed. Death didn't even change that. Because of the love of the Father, though, and I'm telling you this morning, don't you ever forget this. Your heart was in His sights long before your first breath. Before you breathed your first breath. When you were nasty and purple and your head was weird looking. And you came out of your mama's belly. God said, I've got Him. I've got her in my sights. And I'll tell you why. Because the world is corrupted by sin. And even though he knew when your first, first breath was going to be taken, the Father also knew that you were going to be born into sin. The Father had to make a way to be back with his sons and daughters. The Father said, I have to find a way to be back to you. And then I guess it's based upon this. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him who knew no sin... To be sin for us that we might become in Him the righteousness of God. That means sin had to be placed and it had to be sacrificed. And He said, I have to make Jesus. And you, you understand that Jesus never knew sin. He didn't even know what it was. Because if He had tasted sin and He had been involved in sin, then He wouldn't have been that pure sacrifice for you. So you have to understand what He went through that day on Calvary. He never knew sin. And He said He took all that yuckiness, that filth, that despair, that heartache, all that. He, he took that upon Himself for you. Amen. And He took that upon Himself that we can become the righteousness of God in Him. And this, Revelations 1.5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, listen, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. So every drop of blood that he dropped, every drop that when they were beating him, they were hitting him with that whip, and that whip had glass and rocks. And nasty stuff on it. And they were whipping him. And he was cutting his body. And he was bleeding. And he was dumping out blood. And it was cutting him to the core. 
And then they hammered the crown of thorns on him. And, his, and he couldn't even see because his eyes were swollen up from the beating and the blood was coming down. And as he bore that cross and carried it to that nasty place, every drop of blood was for you. And then they laid that cross on the ground and he, he, he said, I'm going to get on that cross because I'm going to take the shame and the sin and all the heartache and all the disease away from the people that I love. And they started hammering the nails and started ringing on top of that nasty hill called the Place of Skulls. And he was sitting there and he bore it like a man. Jesus was the man of all men. And he bore all that. And as the blood was pooling up, it was flowing down that hill for you because of your mistakes. And I'm here to tell you, you got to believe that. That when they raised him up on the cross, and when he was up there, and they were making fun of him, and he barely had anything on, and they were underneath the cross throwing dice for his garments and making fun of him and saying, if he's who he says he is, he can take, that, uh, he can take himself up off that cross and just do what he wants to do. But he said, I don't want to do that because I have to do this so you can go to heaven. So I can take your sins away from you. So you can live abundant life now and you can have an abundant life throughout eternity and your family can get saved too. Can somebody say thank you Jesus for that? And what I'm preaching this morning, you have to believe it. You have to step into it. You have to accept it into your heart that He truly did this. And then, then, and only then, you are transformed by the power of Christ. And I'm here to tell you, He, he said, I have to endure this cross for them. I have to do this, Father. If, the, if you can take this cup away, take it away. But, and He was so, He was so, uh, He knew that the ramifications of it, that He was so stressed out that He was sweating blood. So the blood already started pouring for you long before he even got to the cross. Because he loved you that much. That was a revelation you never thought of that he gave me last night. When he was praying, the blood was already flowing for you. In closing this morning, here's that where we can apply application to our life. I'm trying to wrap up, and I'm fixing to. But this is where you apply what I'm preaching about this morning. The Apostle Paul said it very well in Philippians 3.8. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish. So that I may gain Christ. Paul saying, I'm all in. I'm all in. Because anything this old life could give me, that's trash. Because I am focused on one thing. That is knowing Christ. And that is making sure that I do what He has called me to do. And He is saying, nothing in this life, in this whole world, surpasses the value of knowing Jesus as my Lord. Nothing. But then this, and here is where it is. Are y'all ready for this? Here's where it is. I love how Paul broke this down and made it where you could apply it to your life. It is so good. And here we go. Verse 10. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. Paul said, I may know Him personally and then the power of His resurrection. Why did Paul say that? And this is where the resurrection power becomes applicable to your life where you can apply it. You see... Listen, a dead Christ we must do everything for, but a risen living Christ does everything for me. Yeah. That's powerful. That's the key. And here we go. This is another powerful revelation. This is going to be number three powerful revelation in your life this morning. Our old history and past ends with the cross. Our new history begins with the power of the resurrection because that power is the power that keeps you. Let me say that again. 
Guess what? It says it. Our old history and our past ends with what Jesus did on the cross when He bore our griefs, when He carried our sorrow, when He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace lay upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. And He said, I took your past and I took all your mistakes. And then I was raised up from the dead. And that power is the power that's going to make you live a life as a believer. It's the keeping power of Christ. The resurrection assures us that Jesus can transform our lives every single day. We live empowered by the presence of Jesus to live this changed life. That's what the power of the resurrection does in your life. We are not only forgiven, but we are filled with the mighty power of God who raised Christ up from the dead. And this same power can be applied daily. That's where you apply it. Because He gave you the Holy Spirit and that is the power that you have to overcome. That means His Spirit dwells in you as a believer and you can go through everyday life as an overcomer. That's the power of the resurrection. <clears throat> you can achieve all victory in all things through Christ. And while so many out in the world look at the story of Christ and they miss His saving power, the Spirit-led believer each morning is another opportunity to recognize the Lord's resurrection power. His power to raise us up to a new life and to draw us closer to Him. So what I've been doing is I studied this all week. I said, Jesus, the first thing in the morning, give me your resurrection power to overcome. If something comes where I have to deal with it, I need the same power that resurrected you to help me to overcome today. And that's where it's applicable. That's where you apply it. And I'm here to tell you this morning that this message I, I just preached to you, that I just preached my heart out, this pure gospel message, because at this church, we preach Jesus. And I'm telling you, this is all the hope you need. And, as, and to end this up with all the hope you need of what Christ did for you, now you've got the power to live it. The same resurrection power that rolled back that stone is within you to live this life. So there's nothing you can't overcome. And don't you ever forget that in life. That Jesus said, when I leave, I'm going to send a helper to you, but I'm going to be right there with you. I'll never leave nor forsake you. And that power that he sent is within you. You just got to learn to tap into that resurrection power then you can overcome anything that comes. And all it takes this morning, if you have not had this power in your life, is to simply believe this, and then it happens, what I'm preaching. That's all you got to do is believe it, that Christ died on the cross for you, and on the third day, He was risen for you. A changed life now and for eternity. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to preach what Jesus said. Let's hear it from the source, and I'm done for today. Revelations 1.18. Here we go. And the living one, I died. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys to death and Hades. He has the keys to it all. Everything is underneath his feet. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting for go time when the Lord says, go back and handle business. You have nothing to worry about. When he was risen, he made the clear way for you. And all you have to do is believe the story that I'm preaching this morning. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. You see, death has no sting. When Jesus was raised out of that tomb and that stone rolled away and he walked out of there and he wiped death off of him like the dust off that tomb, death can't touch you no more. Even though death will come, he said, it's okay. Because I've prepared a place for you. <clears throat> but if you don't have that surety in your heart, you need to decide today that you are going to get up and walk out of that old dark life. If you have no hope, if, you've been, if your hope is on the things of this world, if that's what your purpose is to wake up every morning and it's things of this world that are just to fill the void, you're not living life. I lived it, trust me. I had no hope in that, and Jesus changed my life. 
It's time to let the new life begin this morning by the power of Jesus Christ. And that resurrection power will come into your life. We're here to help you. We're here for you. And we have, uh, we have a church that loves you. And I'm telling you, we can help you do it. But you don't need my help because when you do that, the power will come into you to change it. And so, I ask you to roll back that stone of doubt this morning. I ask you to roll back that stone in your heart today that you've always had that blockade. And ask Jesus to come into your heart this morning as your Lord and Savior. You must be born again. You must be born again. This is the day of salvation, Palm Sunday. And you, and, and you just, it, it, it just, it's just a powerful day to accept Christ as your Savior. And I'm letting you know Jesus is waiting with arms wide open. And I ask you to bow your heads at this moment, please. Let everyone bow their head. Nobody's looking around. Does anybody need Jesus in their heart this morning? Truly had thought they had accepted Christ in their heart, but maybe they haven't. And like I always say, if you're 99% sure, you're not 100% sure. You must be born again to receive this power. Is anybody want to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior this morning? Please raise your hand. Ain't nobody looking. There's one. There's two. Oh, I thank you, Jesus, for that. We're going to say a prayer in a minute. I just want to give people a chance for just a second. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I thank you for that. Let's all say this prayer this morning. Y'all repeat after me. You know how we do it as a church. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And I'm in need of you. I know that you died on the cross for me and rose on the third day. I would like to experience this power in my life. I ask you today to come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Wash and cleanse me with your precious blood. Make me new. Fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for loving me and giving me hope in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all can look up. Let's give the Lord a hand for that. If you, if you truly pray that, no matter if we've talked or anything, you know what? Today was your day. I'm telling you, Jesus is the heavens up there cheering right now. They're celebrating. And I want to ask real quick if anybody needs prayer real quick. I'm going to come pray for you. You can just sit down. I know you're hurting. I'm just, I just, can I pray for your body? Father, we thank you for this sweet man. Father, my friend, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for a purpose in his life, Father, to fill him up with hope today, Lord. I ask you, Lord, that just like when Christ was quickened, his mortal body was quickened, Father, that the Holy Spirit comes in here and, and transforms this man's heart. And then by his stripes that he is healed by the stripes Jesus took upon the cross. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for his life. I thank you, Lord, uh, for fresh hope and a fresh anointing and a new season to come upon his life. And I thank you, Jesus, for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Anybody else need prayer? Yes. Sorry. Father, we thank you for my friends, Lord Jesus. We, we, I, this is a prayer that is a special people. And Father, you already know that in my heart. Lord, I ask you, Father, that, that I command the enemy and I find the enemy. Father, the Bible says whatever we find in heaven is bound in heaven. And I say, our bound on earth is bound on earth. Whatever is loosed in heaven is loosed. power comes into their hearts, Father, that, that a fresh peace, that fresh anointing comes upon their life, Father, 
And I thank you, Lord, for the future and the hope they have, Father. I thank you, Lord, for their children and their finances and their health and everything else. And I ask you, Lord, that you bless them today, Lord. That they go home and get rest in you, Lord. And that they enjoy each other. In Jesus' name. Father, I ask you, Lord, to just come and add bring her peace in her heart, Father, that she stands firm in her faith, Lord. And then as she prays, Father, no hindrances, Lord, that, that she that recall the word and how Jesus handled the devil when he fought back the devil with the word and that devil had to flee. So I ask you, Lord, as she draws near to you, Father, that the enemy must leave in the mighty name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that you hear her prayers. And that you that you shine upon her, Father. And I ask you, Lord, that you uh, the prayers of this mother, Father, that you answer this heart, Father. I thank you, Jesus. I bind the enemy in his mighty name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, for her family. That they are healed, that they will find you, Jesus, that you, that the Holy Ghost will draw them. Anybody else? Y'all good? Sure. Go ahead. So, um, I saw my oncologist on Friday, and I shared with the lady that I was nervous about him wanting me to possibly go through litigation, and it's something that I just really didn't want to do. And uh, it was fairly physical. I mean, he did a lot of that. But anyway, so I asked for prayer that um, I wouldn't have that. I pretty much in my mind decided that I didn't want to do it, but you know how you don't want to do something, but then something sort of put in your right. lap, and so then you're thinking, well, maybe I should, you know what I'm saying. Yes. So I went in on Friday, and he never mentioned it. Wow. Give wow. him a lot of God is so good. God is so good. I, I'm so happy for you, and your faith is just uh, an inspiration to me, and we just... Love you so much, Ms. Shannon. I mean, I'm just so happy for you. I can't wait to pray Friday, and and, uh, and so I'm just so excited for her life. Uh, bow your heads. I, I actually don't do that yet. I, I was. I, I, I we got to go. I'm running late. I preached a long one. I understand, and we had to pray for people. But I'm letting you know I've been praying something on my heart that the Lord keeps you. And the power of the resurrection power is the keeping power for us. So I want to pray a priestly prayer over you. It comes out of uh, number six. And the Lord said, I want you to pray this over him this morning. So I got to obey what he told me to do. I hit on it every week and kind of pray it. But I want to really pray it over your life. So bow your heads real quick. Let me pray this over you, okay? Oh, sorry. My lights off. <coughs> I want to pray this prayer over you as a pastor. And so please bow your heads. I, Lord, I thank you for these wonderful people, for their family. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, that you keep them. I thank you, Lord, that, that the power, the same resurrection power of Jesus Christ, Father, is in their lives, Father, that they go forward in Christ, Father. They are overcomers in Christ. And I thank you, Lord, that if God be for us, who can be against us? But I want to pray this word over their life this morning. And it's number 6, 24 through 26. And I'm going to pray this. And as I pray, I'm going to believe God for you this week. So take this to heart. The Lord bless you and keep you. Let the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you. And I ask the Lord to give you peace this week. You can lift up your heads. I pray for each one of you because I love you. And I pray that prayer. And I will keep praying that prayer and interceding for you every night. And if you need me, reach out to me. But I hope you have a good uh, week. And I ask you to invite somebody on Easter Sunday next week. That we can pack this house out. That we can get people saved. 
and I ask you, Lord, to invite one friend. Get the invite cards that are on the connect table. Take 10 of them with you or five of them or three. I don't care. And go throughout town. If you have a friend, reach out to them on Facebook. Text them. Invite them to church on Easter. I want a harvest of souls this Sunday. So I love you guys. You have a good week, and we'll see you Friday for prayer meeting. And actually, Bible studies Wednesday and Thursday.